OK, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think I'll just let a few people sit down, and then we'll get started. OK, so my name is Eric Mountain. I'm a distributed systems expert at Amadeus. I've been working there for about 18 years on a variety of projects, uh, including um, latest uh, move to OpenShift in, in Amadeus. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what Amadeus is, our constraints, the, the needs we have, uh, what we do for the industry, and why we chose to move to, to OpenShift, uh, to adopt OpenShift in our company. So we are a company that provides services to the travel industry. Uh, we're present in 195 countries throughout the world. Um, we are the engine that uh, enables companies to provide services in the travel industry. So we uh, allow companies to uh, distribute their content, for instance, uh, airlines that have seats to sell, um, hotels with rooms to make available, uh, cruise lines, cabins, etc. We make all this content available. We distribute the content uh, on behalf of the companies that actually sell the seats and have the, the cabins and the rooms. Uh, we make this available to uh, travel agencies, uh, online travel agencies, to sell through websites and various other products, uh, such as uh, company um, programs that uh, allow booking inside a company, which streamline the, the travel experience. Um, and, uh, but beyond this, we also provide turnkey solutions for companies to run, well, we run their IT. For instance, we run uh, airline inventory systems, revenue management, um, and we also do, for instance, uh, airport uh, planning, uh, landing and takeoff, and other services for airports. Now, all of the, our services are focused on the traveler experience, uh, the full traveler life cycle from start to finish. So, for instance, uh, we provide the means for travelers to uh, search for fares and uh, optimize their itineraries. Um, we support them uh, in making the actual bookings. We support them in the pre-travel uh, experience, uh, check-in. Uh, we support them during their travel uh, with features such, like, uh, such as booking at destination. Uh, and then we also support them after their trip uh, by providing feedback collection uh, methods, uh, services, uh, and uh, also the um, uh, user experience uh, collection for social media. Uh, we support this out of our uh, data center located in Germany, uh, which is a fairly large data center. Uh, we run follow the sun operations. Uh, we have several operation sites throughout the world, uh, in the US, in, in Germany, in Australia as well. Um, our aim, we, we strive for 100% availability of all our services. Uh, the, I mean, any downtime that we have, any disruption that we have is obviously a cost to our customers and we want the best for our customers. We also want uh, a good traveler experience. Uh, we don't want people queuing up in airports and things like that because check-in doesn't work. Uh, we run, uh, as you might have gathered, several uh, mission-critical services, such as uh, departure control, uh, flight management. Uh, everything runs based on services in our, in our data center. Uh, so we, we handle, I mean, there are big figures. Uh, 525 million uh, travel agency bookings processed last year. Uh, we boarded 695 million uh, passengers throughout the world. Uh, so all this leads on to us having some pretty hard constraints. Um, 
we have a big need for consistency. Um, our booking records, the booking records we manipulate for customers, uh, they can be updated simultaneously throughout the world from different sources. You might have uh, someone booking a hotel that needs to be added to their, to their booking record while at the same time they're checking in or something like that. We also maintain, uh, as I said, inventory for airlines and you need to have consistent, a consistent view of the number of uh, seats in each cabin that are still left as they get sold. Uh, all this requires a high degree of uh, concurrency in the face of simultaneous updates. Uh, we also need very low response times. Uh, people well, don't like to wait, typically, uh, but basically if you're making a booking, if you're uh, boarding someone, you need the system to respond quickly and cons consistently. We also uh, process high volumes of uh, queries. So, for instance, uh, these are figures from December. Uh, we were handling at peak uh, 210,000 queries per second. Uh, so, and a sustained average at 145,000 per second. This is dealt with by many thousands of application servers that we host in the data center. And to give an idea also of the amounts of data that are being uh, manipulated, we log 100, over 100 terabytes of compressed data every day. So where do we stand today? Uh, we are a large distributed service-oriented architecture uh, which is built around in excess of 5,000 pseudo microservices. Now I say pseudo because they don't satisfy all the requirements of microservices. Uh, typically you wouldn't be able to feed uh, the teams that produce some of these services uh, with two pizzas. Okay, they're, they're a bit larger than that. Okay, uh, so but, but there are many different services. It's all broken up. It's very distributed. Uh, so as I said, we have one data center and some disaster recovery sites. Um, this is all hosted on in excess of 5,000 uh, Linux uh, servers. Uh, there's bare metal, virtualization. Um, we, but these servers, they tend to be uh, set up uh, not manually, mechanically, but they're pre-configured for a given task each time. And uh, so a, a machine, be it virtual or physical, has a, a predefined role. And if a, if a physical machine breaks down, you can't easily go and say, okay, I swap another one in its place, because they have this taint, they, a, a color, an attributed role. Uh, so we run n plus x models, n plus 1, n plus 2, depending on the criticality or more, depending on the criticality of the services that these servers are running. Uh, but it's all quite rigid. So, <laughs> okay, so I see some people are familiar with the, the pets versus cattle uh, idiom. I'll just explain that for those that didn't laugh. Uh, basically, the idea is that, uh, okay, when you get a new animal, what's the first thing you do? Uh, at home, you, you give it a name, right? And you stroke it, you nurture it when it's ill, you bring it back to health and stuff like that. And that's typically how we manage our servers. Uh, because as I said, they have these predefined roles, if they're broken, we have to, we have to get them better. Uh, what we really want to do is move, move away from that and get to a situation where we're dealing more with cattle. Uh, if a server's broken, doesn't matter, uh, you might fix it, but you can just swap another one in its place and it'll take over the, the workload. That's the idea. So there are other things. We, we also want to get closer to our customers. Uh, we want to, as I said, our, our data center, our main data center is in Germany. Uh, it's a central location. Uh, clearly, you can't beat the laws of physics. Uh, so if you want to respond very quickly, you need to be closer to your customer physically. That's one aspect. There's also the aspect that in certain cases where it might be appropriate business-wise, uh, we would also like to be able to install appliances directly on customer premises. So this leads on to remote operations. Uh, we also want to give ourselves, uh, well, due to these constraints, we would like to, these needs, we would like to be able to support uh, the ability to be in multiple data centers, maybe to be in the cloud in, in 
so in data centers that are not under our control. Um, and we also want to evolve our current data center model in order to make it more agile, more flexible, more reactive, uh, better use our resources, and so on. Also, we would like to promote higher availability because as I said earlier, we really want, we strive for 100% availability of all our services. So this leads on to a uh, change in uh, the way we think, a uh, big paradigm shift. So we are introducing a new product, which is an internal product, uh, which we call Amadeus Cloud Services, which is basically the next gen application platform that we're building in order to enable all the things I just mentioned. Now, two key points in this new platform that we want to create. The first is we want to have application-centric deployment. What that means is basically ensuring that when we deploy an application, we deploy it and all its dependencies in one block. Uh, I'm sure some of you have met the situation where when you build applications, uh, over time, you actually end up seeing that you're coupled all the way from system libraries, maybe not the kernel, but system libraries, all the way up through the middleware into your application. And you have a, a big coupling there. When you want to upgrade the operating system, you actually need to upgrade the application and things like that, just by a, a sets of transitivity operations that lead you to have these, these dependencies. And that's not very elegant. So we want to break that. We want to encapsulate all the dependencies. This will favor reproducibility and homogeneity. That is to say that uh, because you're deploying exactly the same thing everywhere, uh, you have the same thing everywhere in a controlled and visible manner. And so you can take these blocks and everywhere you will have the same behavior. The other thing is uh, the aim is to make you technology agnostic. So there are two facets to this. Uh, one is that by packaging all the dependencies as a whole, you can have multiple stacks, uh, maybe a Python stack, a C, C++ stack, a Perl, PHP stack, whatever. Um, and it really doesn't matter. The platform doesn't need to know what's in this, in this box. Um, so, and the second aspect is, for instance, say my operations, they want to upgrade from RHEL 7.1 to 7.2 on the systems. I don't want to be a bottleneck for that. I want to be, don't want to have to say to them, no, but guys, you can't upgrade that part of the operating system because we know we're coupled to it and uh, it's no good. There's this big coupling and we need to break out of it. And finally, uh, it'll simplify operations uh, because it defines clearer boundaries between the system and the application itself and the operations will be able to automate better because they are just deploying units that they don't need to look inside of so much. The second point is automation in general and automated scheduling. Uh, the idea is that basically we want to get away from deciding where things run. We want to decouple what runs from where it runs. And we want this to happen in an automated fashion. We want the system to determine where each task can run, what is most optimal, and not have people to, have that, to make that decision. So the stack that we chose to, to implement this is uh, OpenShift, which relies on Linux, and in particular the, the Linux containers features of the Linux kernel, Docker, and Kubernetes. So, just to explain, the, these, there's basically two layers here involved. And one is all the container aspects, so container kernel features and Docker providing Linux container technology, uh, images, uh, image format, uh, and the fact that they're easy to run, kick off, and deploy. And this addresses the application-centric deployment aspect of what I was mentioning just now. The second part is Kubernetes, which addresses the decoupling of what runs from where it runs, the scheduling. Uh, Kubernetes takes care of orchestrating the containers. It uh, manages the cluster. 
uh, and decides where things should run. It does auto automatic placement, and it also heals the system when it breaks. So to this end, we set up a partnership with Red Hat. Um, the idea here was um, three main points. Uh, we, we started almost a year ago, uh, somewhere between 10 and, 10 and 12 months ago. Uh, we have been working on our side with the Red Hat teams. Uh, we have developers who are included in the Red Hat scrums uh, who contribute code to OpenShift and other layers, Docker and Kubernetes. Uh, we also have Red Hat team members embedded in our own teams and where we, develop, we work in France. Uh, our R&D team on, on this particular aspect is located in France, in Nice. And we have some Red Hat uh, consultants who work with us on site. And we've been making open source contributions thanks to this. Now, the thing is that you don't become an open source company overnight. It's not just because you decide to become an open source company that tomorrow you'll be an open source company. It's a, it's a tricky business. Um, open source world is actually quite challenging. Uh, it can be easy to make uh, contributions, fixes, that kind of stuff. But if you want to really step up and get involved and in a, in a long-term way in projects, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, an, it's a certain degree of effort. And the thing is that Red Hat really helped us here because they uh, acted as a uh, means of being introduced into the open source world, uh, for instance, uh, helping us uh, maybe defend our ideas uh, with the Google guys on Kubernetes. Um, and they also served as a... Uh, reviewers, critics of our line of thought and uh, what we might uh, want to put out there, which features might, might be acceptable, which features were maybe completely stupid. Um, and so Red Hat really, really have helped us enormously in getting out into that open source world. So what is OpenShift? OpenShift, uh, a cluster, <coughs> basically is made up a whole load of systems and there's a certain category of systems, the masters, which take care of holding the configuration, the OpenShift configuration, the cluster configuration. They know which nodes are available, which systems are available to run your tasks. They schedule the tasks. They establish the configuration, publish the configuration, etc. The nodes are the slaves. They execute your actual tasks. Um, they answer to the masters. They uh, basically run what we call pods. So a pod is a set of containers. It's a composition of containers. If you just have individual containers, uh, it, it not really, you, you lack binding and the ability to run some of the more complex applications. Uh, a complex application is not going to be single container, single process. Uh, there's always going to be multiple processes in your, in your more complex applications, even your more complex services. So the, the pod notion allows you to compose containers. The pod is defined by a blueprint, which as it happens is a, is a little JSON file, um, and this is what is consumed by the masters to know what should be deployed everywhere. So for instance, I can say to the masters, I can give them a blueprint that says that a particular pod, I would like five replicas of it running throughout my system. The masters will schedule those pods, they will decide which nodes they should run on, and they will keep them running, make sure they are running, and uh, deal with those aspects. And you can have lots and lots of different kinds of pods, and the masters will schedule them. If one of them goes up in flames, uh, the master will take care of rescheduling that pod somewhere else. Uh, the system also has mechanisms built in for configuration drift avoidance, which was a very important feature for us, which means that basically, say, the, the machine that went up in flames there, maybe it didn't quite go up in flames, maybe it was just extremely slow, maybe it had frozen or something for a while, uh, and so you end up with a partition in your network. So 
when it returns to service, it might still have the pods that it was running before and Kubernetes will have rescheduled them elsewhere, OpenShift will have rescheduled them. So you end up with a, a conflict in effect. Um, and so in fact, OpenShift will resolve that conflict and will terminate the pods that are still running on that machine that recovered and that shouldn't be there anymore since they've been sent elsewhere. So configuration drift avoidance is a, is a very nice feature and all the self-healing. Um, a little bit more about pods. So pods, they're this black box in which you package your, your application and with all its dependencies. Um, one thing is that uh, a pod, as a, it's identical everywhere. And so if you have a service listening on a port, it's listening on the same port absolutely everywhere. And this is thanks to the fact that each pod gets its own IP address, making it basically a logical host. And all this works thanks to uh, also features that you can get from a YAS, for instance, to allocate IP addresses. But also a very nice feature of OpenShift is the ability to mount overlay networks. So that's logical software-defined networks uh, on top of your normal physical or YAS-provided uh, networks, infrastructure as a service-provided networks. And this is, this is a very, very powerful feature. A little bit more on pods. So pods also have uh, metadata associated, which uh, allow you to do lots and lots of uh, diverse, uh, flexible things. For instance, you can uh, identify certain pods as maybe running on being the production or being a test uh, pod. Uh, you can identify them as being maybe part of a canary uh, that, you're, that you're trying out. Uh, and things like that, which you can use to, to set up uh, load balancer routing rules and things like that. Now, I said that pods can run anywhere. The, the Kubernetes, OpenShift, Scheduler will decide where things run on your system. But so, how do I know how to talk to a service which can be running anywhere in my cluster at any given time. So the answer to that is that OpenShift provides mechanisms for defining services, and it does so decoupled from the pod definition. And you might argue, well, why don't I just define the service as part of my pod? I mean, the pod in the end is listening on these ports. Why don't I just say in that definition that I have the services? Well, decoupling the service definition from the pod definition provides you with a lot of power and a lot of flexibility. As I said, for instance, you can say that a certain pod is actually a canary that's being used to try out a new version of your software. You might do A-B testing, um, that kind of stuff. So decoupling the definition gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, the service definition is made up of two main things. The uh, port definition that says where your service will be listening, what, your pod, what port your pod will be listening on, and also a selector. A selector is a bit like the where clause of an SQL query. Uh, it basically says which pods will be the ones that are providing this service at a given time. The list of endpoints, so where the pods really are, where the service re is really reachable, is maintained in what's called the API server in OpenShift. So this is the, the uh, REST uh, server that you can interrogate to find out uh, things about the current configuration. It's also how you implement changes on the OpenShift uh, cluster uh, through the REST API. You can use the UI, but the UI uses the REST API. Um, and Basically, you can, you can watch this uh, API server for changes in the list of endpoints, and that allows you, for instance, to do things like update load balancers to say where, what the list of current endpoints is and things like that, and therefore get traffic into your, into your system. Uh, you also have uh, the ability to... Uh, there's, there's a built-in DNS server in OpenShift, 
and that allows services inside the cluster to discover other services through DNS. You can also discover them through environment variables, for instance, but the fact that you can discover them through DNS is quite powerful because it allows you to uh, put applications inside OpenShift, inside containers, without being OpenShift native, without knowing how to interrogate the API server and watch the endpoints. So what does OpenShift do for us uh, in particular beyond all this? Well, there's, as I said, the fact that we can plug all the stacks we want into OpenShift. We don't, OpenShift is not judgmental. Uh, if we want to do C++, we can do C++. If we want to do Python, Go, Java, we can, we can do all of those. And we can extend, we can have uh, more stacks to make our developers happy. Uh, while deciding which stacks are acceptable, which ones aren't, but at least we have more ability to be open with respect to what people would like to see and free them up to innovate and have good ideas and, and you know, do a bit what they like. The next thing is that OpenShift is designed to accommodate constraints. It, for instance, w w one thing that's really important to us is that we don't actually have all our traffic coming into our system on HTTP. We have lots and lots of different kinds of customers with lots and lots of different needs and different protocols that they support. And we need to be able to move to something that supports that as well. We can't just say, we're moving to OpenShift, so everything's going to be HTTP. That just doesn't fly. So, in particular, one of the protocols we use is uh, something in-house, uh, which is kind of like HTTP2, but invented a long time ago, so it doesn't have all the features of HTTP and things like that, okay, but the idea is that it does support uh, persistent connections, low latency, uh, and multiplexing in particular, and that was very important to us, and OpenShift lets us do that, because it doesn't impose HTTP. So then, what does deployment look like? So folks can go and uh, they, they build their pods, they assemble their pods um, in development. Uh, then they might want to run that, say, on a laptop. So with OpenShift, you can, uh, you can run it using, say, libvirt if you have a, a Linux laptop and you can spawn a cluster of VMs. Um, we contributed, in fact, I don't know, I can't remember if we contributed to the libvirt OpenShift Ansible deployment mechanism or if we actually contributed it, uh, is one or the other, definitely. Uh, we also, um, sorry, uh, we, you can then deploy to a variety of infrastructure as a service. Um, you, so it can be public or private clouds, whatever, it can be Amazon, GCE, or say, for instance, you could also be deploying to OpenStack uh, for your production system. Uh, we actually contributed, this is one of our open source contributions in all this business, is that we contributed the OpenStack uh, deployer for uh, OpenShift Ansible. Um, and, and deploying to production is just scaling up what you tried out in test and on your laptop. It's the same pod, but just more pods, more replicas. So OpenShift basically gives us one unified process for deploying our code to whatever system we want, be it a laptop, be it test systems, be it production. So to conclude, uh, what we're doing with OpenShift is that we're building our next generation uh, application platform and it's giving us the ability to macro-manage our clusters um, we get self-healing, resiliency out of it. We, it's, it's a much more dynamic system. You can add and remove things. Uh, the system takes care of dealing with that. And it gives us a capability to move into the cloud to have more data centers. Uh, it also simplifies the life of our operations because it gives them a uniform, uh, well, simplified uh, operations model and reduces the, the effort for them, uh, makes life a lot easier, much less complex, much less, uh, well, you don't have all this setup of servers, etc. An application is deployed as one item. Uh, and very importantly, we see this as a way of enabling the transition to a DevOps or even maybe a NoOps model. Uh, and finally, 
the, uh, the collaboration with Red Hat has been really, really good. Um, it's, it's been great getting into that open source world and, and working with an excellent team of people who've been really critical of our work and known to advise us and, uh, and very, very helpful. So now I don't know if you have any questions. Uh, thanks for attending. <laughs>